So bikepacking has become really popular in the last couple of years. It's experienced explosive growth, and it's really grown from kind of this niche uh, endurance racing focus activity to something more mainstream. But that wasn't always the case. In this episode of PLP Talks, I'm going to interview Eric Parsons of Revelate Design Works. He was one of the few uh, original bikepacking bag makers. We're going to talk about how his business has evolved, what keeps him going, and we're also going to talk about what it feels like to have been a pioneer in so many ways in the bikepacking space and now have larger brands kind of just jump in. This show is made possible by listeners and viewers like you. And this episode is also supported by Art of Survival Century. You can check them out at survivalcentury.com. The event is on the weekend of May 26th, and it's a whole weekend of bike fun. There are options to do a paved century, a metric century. And on the Sunday of that weekend, there's actually a bunch of gravel grinder events. Everything from a full-blown 75-mile gravel grinder to more family-friendly distances. And all these rides happen around the Lava Beds National Monument, where there's lots of petroglyphs and pictographs and cinder cones, lots of stuff to take photos of. So learn more about these events at survivalcentury.com. And one last thing before we jump in, if you guys are enjoying these interviews, be sure to share it with a friend. I'm sure there are other bike nerds out there. So with all that, put on your earbuds or expand the screen if you're watching it in YouTube. Pretend like you're working at your desk. It's okay, we won't tell, and enjoy the show. So today's guest is Eric Parsons, the man behind R- Revelate Design Works. Uh, I'm super stoked to have him on the show. His company actually just turned 10, so I think we're going to talk a, li- a lot about that journey uh, to get here. So thank you, Eric, so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks, Russ. Thanks for getting in touch. Yeah. Well, first off, congratulations for, for making it 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, it just sort of feels like you know another, another. I don't know. It doesn't really feel like much, but it's it's when I look back at it now, it's like wow, two thousand eight, two thousand seven was that was a long time ago. I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you guys didn't make like a uh, seat bag shaped cake or something to to celebrate with. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was a busy fall, and uh, there's definitely some festivities in in order. So uh, things things are gonna happen because yeah, we haven't really like made a big deal about this yet at all but um we're gonna start doing some his doing walking down some history lanes yeah, <laughs> yeah. so let's talk about those yeah. early days you, so you started in 2008 i mean how many other people were making these style of bags at that time yeah i started in like fall of 2007 that's when i was actually like selling stuff um and at the time it was me and carousel design works jeff boatman and uh that's really it as far as my knowledge goes um a local guy up here in anchorage it was well not in anchorage but in in alaska that was also a pioneer of fat bikes was having somebody make frame bags for his bikes at the time and they were pretty basic rudimentary but you know uh, people were using them um so and that that kind of got me interested because i was like i kind of saw those and I was like, oh, we could do these way better, way cooler, way more technical and kind of modernize them. And uh, so that, that's kind of what, that was one of the many things that got me interested in doing it. Cool. So like how early on from your first bags did you decide to turn it into business or that you, you, you saw that could be a business? Yeah, it's funny because I the, <laughs> the first two years um, that I was doing this, basically I I. I was I was an engineer. A lot of people we kind of I was kind of realized know, know that, but um, I had this disconnect between like uh, what I was doing and not really seeing any results. You know, I was like, okay, I was like design something, and but then it, like I might see it get built maybe in like a year or two, and like I just there was no real like feedback loop of like, hey, this is good. Um, so I started sewing and making gear because I wanted stuff that worked well for me. And, and uh, it kind of clicked pretty easily. And um, so I started sewing my own stuff and then um, got my hands on an industrial machine, like a good walking foot, totally manual machine. And then uh, I was, I just got more into it. And um, 
yeah, literally like one day uh, my roommate had a bike and uh, I was like, I'm going to like time trial myself on making a frame bag. <laughs> and it's like, and like, if I could do it in under like four hours, then maybe I could actually like make money selling them for something, you know? Right. <laughs> and like I did it and it was like, when I look, you know, it's like, I think about that bag and it was like super ghetto. Um, you know, I would really no idea how to build stuff for real back then, but I could get stuff that would work, you know? And, um, so that's kind of what I did. I mean, I just started, um, making stuff and, um, I think I took out a, a classified ad on MTBR saying, Hey, I make frame bags and, um, people doing like, you know, there was a big demand up here because we have these winter races, uh, and events for, for, you know, what's now known as winter fat biking. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, before it got cool, and, uh, and and but then the Arrowhead 135 was like the only other thing in like the lower 48, and like people in like Minnesota knew that knew about this stuff too, and they were like, okay, this is, you know, so they would call me and say, hey, can I get a bag for uh, whatever, and I, yeah, and so that was that. That was uh, it was super like basement, you know, basement <laughs> stuff. Cool. So does the fact that you're based in Alaska, how has that influenced your design or the products you, you started out with? Yeah, um, well, I started out pretty, like, we're talking like starting, starting out, it was very winter focused. Like, I was really trying to make stuff that, like, worked for winter overnight and, like, ultra, like, the ultra racing stuff at the time, like the 100 milers, and because just people needed to carry stuff. And it was like, well, how are we going to do this? Um, and people were doing it, you know, with, like, racks and just, ramming shit on their bike <laughs> and but i was like you know there's got to be a better way so um yeah it, it it was a huge influence i mean like i you know my first one of the first things i made was uh what's now kind of the expedition pogies um and so that was like one of like the second things i was actually making um and then like the the original gas tank was this really big like double zip opening thing that you could shove a ton of stuff into right and um, and so yeah, as far as starting off goes. And then as things evolved, as like kind of, we kind of, you know, very quickly it went from like this winter sort of specific thing to bike packing as we know it now. Cause it was like right away, it was like people were like the Tour Divide came on the scene like right around 2007, 2008 as well. People started racing the Colorado Trail right around then. And um, so it was like some of the like kind of long standing relationships like, Scott Morris, Chris Plesco, it was like, hey, we need smaller seat bags for our, you know, trips in the desert in, in Colorado. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I can do that. And so um, made stuff for them. But it's getting back to your kind of original question as far as like how it in, how is being up here impacts design. Um, you know, like the trips that I like to do, because just because we don't have a huge trail system, like, or dirt road system or you know whatever you know it's it's kind of it kind of feeds the creativity you know what i mean um so we started doing me and my buddy we started doing these like kind of wilderness like pack raft adventures you know and um and they're they're brutal on bikes and brutal on gear you know just like absolutely destroy stuff um so like that that was kind of my like common denominator is like okay like if, if i'm gonna build something like can it withstand like one of those trips or like can it you know if i have a seat bag can i like throw it into a bunch of trees and bushes and like it'll still be okay can i like can i do that for three hours and it'll still be okay you know? <laughs> so like that yeah that, that's the short of it yeah um, cool yeah. so um you're bag designs have evolved and it seems like, you know, that's kind of a general trend in bike packing. Do you think we're at the finished form of what a bike packing bag should look like or will new materials be introduced or will new kind of technologies be introduced to, to the bag that'll ultimately shape it still? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think everything's still developing. Um, um, I would say, no, I mean, like, absolutely. Um, the, the sky's the limit. I mean, like, that's just technology. Um, we're gonna, everybody will constantly be able to start pushing things. Whether that's for good or bad is another thing, because it's like, you know, if you look at the backpacking world, it's like you could take a simple backpack and overcomplicate it 
super easily. Yeah, I think we're a little bit past like the golden age of like, oh, I, you know, um, you know here's this. Well, I don't know, maybe we're not. As far as like completely new takes on things, and I kind of take that back because it's like there's there's lots of new. Like mm-hmm. people are coming up with new stuff all the time. And yeah. I think it's just as more and more people are doing it and more and more people are building the bags, you know, there's like that many more people thinking around outside of the box too. Um, so yeah, no, I think it's an exciting time and there's yeah. tons of potential still. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like, um, I mean, bike packing's exploded. You see the bags everywhere. Uh, for you as a business, like at, at what point did you get a sense that it was going to stop being this niche hyper niche thing and be something that a lot, a lot more people would enjoy. Um, about eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, a, lo- a long time ago. Cause it yeah. was like, I, I knew the potential was there. Um, cause it was like, people were, you know, people were using, people were bike packing, but it's like, I saw the application of the bags on like a bigger scale. It's like, um, for example, like our, our frame bags and like the tangle, um, mm-hmm half bag it's like from day one of that i was like this is a bag that's going to be super versatile and like you can use it on any so many different bikes and for so many different uses and so yeah i mean i think as soon as we started making them like that we were i wasn't like dealing with around with it i was like we're going to do production of these and make you know a lot of them because they're going to catch on um so i kind of um yeah i mean i think i as far as like having the like real foresight of like of, of like how big of a niche is like bike packing gonna be, I don't I don't know, um, but I knew as far as like some of my ideas and bags go that they were gonna do pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how um, how yeah. soon in the business did you um, have people helping you make the bags? Was that pretty? It sounds like it was pretty early. Yeah, around two thousand. So like about two years. Okay. Um, I built everything myself for about two years um, and then started getting reinforcements. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there's kind of a long story behind that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's it been, um, what's it been like growing the business? Was it something you had an aptitude for uh, from the very beginning or was it like a, just like a painful learning process, like with other kind of small manufacturers? Um. I wouldn't call it painful. Like I had no aptitude for business really. So no, I'm not a business person. Um, well, I can't say that because I have a business, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I just, I learned everything as I went. And like, I, I'm fortunate enough that people liked our stuff and bought it. And we kind of had a boom like a while back because like we were kind of the only people making bags and it's like we were kind of the only and we had production of the bag so like we had sort of source but even then it was like we still couldn't keep up so we had this like really pretty incredible um growth um a number of years ago and so like you know that that fed a lot of things is that we it, it was it was successful because we were filling a need and uh early on I didn't have to try too hard. All I had to do was like make, you know, try to get, try to just keep making stuff, <laughs> try to keep making, try to, try to keep making good bags and keep people happy as opposed to like having to try to like market and, you know, really crunch numbers and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It was, yeah. um, you know, I, I got really blown away when I started seeing the bags like carried at like REI and everything. <laughs> was that a big moment for you just to, to see like this mass, um, kind of distribution? You know, REI in particular um, was a very slow, soft start, I would say, because um, we, we actually started selling to them almost six years ago. And uh, yeah, because we met one of the main buyers at Interbike and uh, he was really into it. And uh, it, and then I really dragged my heels because I was like, ah, do I really want to go down this road? And uh, eventually it was like, uh, you know, it kind of made sense. And so we... Um, and REI is set up to be very, very kind of corporate, but like set up for kind of big brands, really. And so like we had, I had huge headaches and growing pains starting off because, you know, we didn't really have a warehouse or all this like little stuff, like all this sort of things that they kind of require to integrate with. And mm-hmm. so we kind of had to like just sort of bite the bullet and 
deal yeah <laughs> and like and hope it led and I can kind of hope it led to greener pastures I guess you could say right and, right um, and then that was really only about last year when they when they were like okay this is catching on let's double double down and um and it was great you know um so but yeah, yeah. that's that's been a pretty good deal yeah i think so. i don't know if it was last year or the year before but i remember i was in los angeles for um visiting family and i went to the rei in santa monica and like mm -hmm. like you walk in the door the first thing you see is like a mountain bike filled with your bags it's like whoa that's <laughs> it's it's really kind of made it in, in in a lot of ways <laughs> yeah it's, it's interesting because it's like we think it's niche and, and but it's like rei kind of makes sense because they're kind of where everybody goes to get camping you can buy like titanium cups there it's sort of like it it kind of made sense for us you know um mm -hmm. and as a as a good channel so yeah cool so i guess what's in your 10 years what's the thing you're most proud of with the business? That's a good question. Um, I guess, huh. I think our credibility, I think still stands up there and sort of our recognition that, you know, I was, I was, we was whatever, however you want to call it, um, that we were kind of one of the first people doing this and that we started and we, started off a lot of the the concepts that are completely mainstream today it's like um you know the concept of a modular harness system you know that was ours um you know calling things tank bags was was ours um, mm -hmm. you know like the list goes on like we were we were the first people to do like holster holster seat bags we were the first people to do waterproof handlebar bags um you know we have a lot of we have a lot of firsts um mm -hmm. and um, I guess I'm pretty proud of that stuff. Um, yeah. Even though it sort of like gets under my skin when people call things something that like, well, that's actually our product. <laughs> it sort of become like this category. Yeah, like, yeah, like Xerox or Kleenex or something. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. 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 Totally. yeah. It's it's a. Um, it seems like it's. I mean, it is like a completely different landscape. Now, like, how do you feel like having paved the way and then now seeing the bigger brands like kind of jump in? Um, I mean, you must be there's flattery in some sense, but <laughs> I think it's fine. I, you know, whatever it, it is, what it, it, it's, I guess, you know, it's an, it's a, it's the industry. Once, once big companies find something that they can do well with, they'll, they'll do their own take on it. Um, I just, I still go kind of go back to that thing I just said about like, Hey, we came up with that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then they use the name for it or they, mm -hmm. they borrow, de they borrow like specific details. Like they'll cherry pick some details that we use and then they'll put it on their bag. And that that's the stuff that irks me more than like them having a whole line, you know, um, right. just, just cause I take it personally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So have, have you ever, thought about like uh is there like a patent process for for some of those details or is that something that you know you're you're fine leaving open sourced or well there there is and like the more you look at patents the more you realize that it's a big deal and they're expensive to get and maintain and so it's like well you could you know you there's several things i could have patented technically maybe um but then it's like okay is it worth the thirty thousand dollars to protect that detail or whatever amount of money it would be you know um and um and we are going that direction with some things that we're working on but um you know it has to be something that's like you can't just patent a bag because it's like well that's that's sort of a common you know i, I don't want to get delve into patent law here but right. um, <laughs> people ask people ask that question a lot and it's like um you know, yeah, a utility patent ha really has to be like an invention and, you know, a really specific thing that you're trying to claim. And, you know, you could get much less expensive design patents for like what something looks like. And but then, you know, you change a panel and it doesn't look like that. <laughs> you know, it's like so that could you, know, you could just waste that money. And when you change it next year, you know. Right. So that's the short, that's the short story. To yeah. Answer. <laughs> Is there anything that you know, you're, you're 10 years in, is there anything that you wish you knew back when you started that you know now? I don't know, you know, hmm. I have to think about that one a little bit. Um, <laughs> nothing, nothing just like slams me in the face. Just yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> sorry. 
Um, so I opened up uh, some questions to the interwebs, and um, uh, a lot of people, or a handful of people, asked about custom colors, like why why you um, kind of limit the co color palette where it seems like a lot of people buy bags for aesthetics and different colors. Well, I guess I have to ask the question: What what color people want? And we don't we don't get we don't get much feedback. And um, it's like, and we do we. I, I saw I saw your questions on Instagram, and I I definitely scratched my head because we've been offering you know up to six colors on a lot of different for years. Um, um, and we we have done we do custom stuff. Um, you know, we actually <laughs> diving into that like our. We had a custom gray that was actually different than a lot of other X Pack grays. Um, then we actually do a kind of an exclusive finishing treatment to our fabrics that that only we do, um, which gives it a little bit more abrasion resistance and a little bit more. Uh, it gives it that sheen that you don't see on any other of the X Pack bags. But yeah, you know, we're we're open to we're totally open to doing colors, and we we're we're doing a purple now that's sort of like a limited run. Um, but you know, the the thing to keep in mind is that we're love doing colors, but it does come down to like, well, is it actually going to sell, or like, does it actually sell? It's like, you know, we're we're kind of cutting back on some colors now because we have like all these items and all these SKUs that are just like color 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 and it's like well we actually we've been sitting on them for like months and right um but yeah it's like you know we, we try to do interesting things it's like we we actually were years ago we pushed um dimension polyan who makes the expat fabric that everybody else uses we we pushed them to get a camo and we had a an exclusive digital camo for us and then um then they had to change that because we couldn't get the base material from the camo company anymore um, and then we're we're the ones that push them to get the the alpine, the white camo, and also the black. So like we're responsible for bringing those out to the masses because it's like once they develop the fabric, they won't actually be able to sell it. But you know, right. so we're the ones that actually got them to bite the bullet to make, <laughs> make this. Stuff. Right. And I don't think anybody really knows that, but it's like that's the reason those camos exist is because we. We, we we pushed for it and we we because we we were buying so much of the other fabric you know that we have a little bit of a little bit of clout and so they were willing to do that yeah of all the colors you sell like what what sells most is it black or black yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, that's that's really the the answer to that question is like black sells the most like people like by default they go with black and that's like well. Uh, it goes with every bike. <laughs> it goes with every bike and it's yeah, like we'd love to do some other colors but it's like and, and also it, like these bags kind of get complicated because it's all part of a system and people want matching bags and and that's what kind of ra ran us down this rabbit hole of having so many SKUs it's like if we're going to have a a red or a gray or a camel whatever you know then we want to have people want to have like a matching seat bag and a matching feed bag and a matching right. you know it's like <laughs> things so then you all, all of us if you do that by three colors all of a sudden you have <laughs> you have 20 things to keep track of you know and so that's yeah, that's that. And we're, and additionally, you know, we're not, we're not a tiny little cottage business anymore. You know, we have pretty big production and it's like, we can't just make three of something and call it, and like, just for the sake of making it, you know what I mean? Um, we, we do that sometimes just for fun, obviously, but like, as far as like selling it on our website, it's like, we usually we're making like, you know, more than that. <laughs> so, yeah. We're not as custom as we used to be. Yeah. Yeah. So what um, what still excites you about the the business operations? Is it the design, new products, or is it like the fulfillment end? Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm totally like product driven person or like design driven person. So it's like I still have like a laundry list of of things that are going to be developed and that's sort of as the business has grown over the last few years, a lot of that's taken a real back seat or hasn't happened nearly as fast as I've wanted it to. Uh, because we have all these, you know, we've had growth hurdles, we've had fulfillment hurdles, we've had yada, yada, yada. Um, but yeah, like a, a lot of my time is 
not spent like designing stuff. It's just push, you know, getting things through and running the business. So, uh, but yeah, like I, as far as staying excited goes, that that's what keeps me excited is like thinking about like new stuff to make. And like I said, like the, the list is still pretty big. So. Yeah. <laughs> fleshing all those out i mean that's why i got into this so it's like that's that's what still keeps me excited yeah so you've done a lot of uh first in terms of uh, bike packing designs um are there any other current bag designers that uh you're stoked on or that you know that you admire yeah the, the people come up with new stuff it's like um scott and porcelain rocket they've you know they've done awesome and uh like andrew at bedrock he's you know these guys are doing amazing new things all the time um mm-hmm. And there's, you know, I could, don't know them by first name basis, but like, you know, there's other people. It's basically, yeah, the, those two guys in particular, because they, they've been doing it a really long time too now um, and kind of have the same, I guess, ethic, a little bit of the same ethic that I do. Like they're not going to, um, they just flesh out their own ideas and they're not going to like copy somebody's. Um, do you have a sense of... Um where bike packing will go? I mean, is it still at an upper tra- trajectory in interest or has it peaked or do you have a sense of like where it is in that, uh, that bell curve? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think it's still, I think it's still on the upward curve. I think what's going to happen is I think people, people not really in the bike packing scene are going to, we're, we're going to start seeing more like the, the hybrid ideas going on. And it's like, it's something we've, kind of pushed for a while with like, you know, like I said earlier, like the tangle, for example, it's like take your traditional old school touring bike and throw some of our bike packing bags on it. And it just becomes more streamlined and more useful. And, you know, so I think it might not be, (laughs) it might not be called bike packing, but I think you'll see like the gears kind of keep cross pollinating a little bit, uh, into, into like, um, other other avenues yeah mm-hmm. uh, as far as just the activity goes i mean i don't know i mean i think i think it's going to keep growing i think um it's great to see like more and more like women getting involved in bike packing in the bike packing community and there's like a pretty big push lately and um for like growth in that um, right making that like more approachable mm-hmm. um which we're we're super supportive of um yeah I think it's fun. I think people are having a ton of fun with it. And that's like, you know, we we mentioned like the early days, it's like back then it was like, well, it was pretty racing focused, like in the early days, because just because people, people needed gear to be able to do these events. And now it's, it's turned more into like way more of like a creative outlet and like, and that creative outlet, as far as like roots and stuff goes, it's also comes down to like bike setup and bag choice. And it's like, they're just, everybody's individualizing everything. And um, there's so many choices now that it's, I don't know, it's kind of, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. I do enjoy like um, seeing people's bike setups where it's kind of like a hybrid of different styles yeah. you know, for uh, like me personally, like I ride smaller bikes. So um when I get a frame bag for my bikes, it's almost like useless. So I have to use painters, but I do like some of the aspects of bike packing bags. So always kind of mixing and, and matching things. Yeah. And that's what it kind of comes down to is like, what, what bike are you riding? Do you have room for X, Y, Z? Like, you know, just filling it out and filling the needs. Where do you hope to, to take Revelate in the next couple of years? Yeah. Good question. Um, we're, we just kind of went through a lot of kind of changes here over you know as far as like how we're set up Mm -hmm. and so we're kind of gonna use that i think as a foundation for growing a little bit more and you know kind of not like i don't know we we still want to be this um creative like kind of original force in in the bikepacking world um and just essentially like bring bringing cool new stuff Mm -hmm. to market and um and yeah, just being like relevant. I mean, that's kind of my goal is to like, yeah, um, I don't have any like super lofty like visions to tell you here, but I think it's um, with the with the growth, it, it, it you know everything has matured. You, you know, it's like we I think we went through this huge spike a couple of years ago, and now we're um, things are growing and expanding, but it's just a little bit more organic now. How do you um, how do you define success in the business? 
Ooh, God, we're getting so business it's, here. Right? I'm just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just being like a poster, like, that, success, like that. <laughs> well, it's stuff that I'm like really curious about, you know, because I feel like, you know, we, we see uh, the front end of people having adventures, but in order for that stuff to happen, there's like this real kind of, you know, kind of back end that people don't get to talk about. So. Right. Um, well, not going bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> You know, being <laughs> yeah, defining success. I think um, a lot, I think, okay, getting, okay. I can think of some real answers here. It's like, I guess one is like, you know, having good customer service, like actually being able to help everybody out when they need something. Um, and kind of being, I, I think for us, it's sort of like being kind of a go-to brand is like kind of what I would define as success. It's like, oh, you want some good bags, get late stuff, you know? Um, and then also being able to treat our dealers well, like being able to stock everybody the way they want to be stocked and, you know, try to be efficient as possible so we can give, you know, margins to our dealers that we're, you know, deal with. Um, I think that's, that's been important. I think, um, yeah, that's that's how I would think about it as yeah, cool. and just being being as supportive as possible and like you know, being like a real member of the the greater community. It's funny when people say like Revelate's like the big boys. You know, like, <laughs> see that I'm like really you know there's like four of us here, um, <laughs> you know, and, um, but it's like you know yeah. Well, that is like a strange phenomena. You know, you've just been around so long. You know that. You know, maybe in the very beginning you were punk rock, but now like people don't perceive you that way because you you have such a presence and you've been making the bags for such a while. I know, and I love punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be one. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to be cool. No, um... So do you get to? Uh, I mean, I think I probably know the answer to this question, but do you get to ride your bike as much as you'd like? <laughs> Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> I I love riding my bike. I I, I guess I, I don't get to do as many like tours and like overnights as I'd like to, but uh, I ride my bike a lot. Um, and it's just, it's like, you know, I have a family, I have a seven year old and I have this, I have a business and, um, you know, so it's like, I don't get to just blow off like for two weeks at a moment's notice anymore. Uh, but it's like, yeah, I get to ride a lot and I get to, you know, daily get to you know test our stuff test test new ideas and stuff like that so um but yeah i i do have some you know some pangs of like when i see people that are like um when it's like cold and dark here and you're kind of just doing the grind and there's somebody that's like i'm on a month trip and yeah um, Baja. And like, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's so easy you know? <laughs> Well, at least your yeah. your products get to experience those those warm days. <laughs> to embrace the yeah, what's that word called? But, yeah. So if you uh, um, if you if you had a chance to go on a trip like tomorrow, do you have a list of places you you'd want to tour through? I you know I fell in love with South America and um, Bolivia in particular. Like mm -hmm. a, a number of years ago, I've done two trips there, and then I'd go back there at a moment's notice, like drop the hat and do something cool um so like if someone would be like hey here's a month go do a bike trip i would probably just book a ticket to la paz and figure it out <laughs> yeah um so i'm a mountain person i like mountains climbing mountains and looking at big mountains so it's like i, I need big mountains if i'm gonna yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. cool well this uh, this looks like a, a good place to end. Uh, thank you, Eric, so much for joining us. Um, if you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to like, share, subscribe. And if you have any questions for Eric, leave those in the comments below. And if you have suggestions for future guests, also leave those in the comments below. And thanks for watching. Thanks, Eric, for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Russ. Take it easy. Cool. Let me uh, kill the recording here.